please join me in a warm welcome for Jackie Woodson. Hi, everybody. Oh my gosh, look around. My favorite line from Hamilton, look around, look around, how lucky we are to be alive right now. Sort of. <laughs> I was singing that, you know, before, during the election, and I was like just all primed, you know, it's like, look at the changes that are happening, and, you know, gay marriage, and equal rights, and, you know, we're going to have our first pre... <sighs> <laughs> look around how lucky we are to be alive right now. Look around, I mean, look, we're in a room full of social workers! Yeah. Woo! People who share our thinking, who share our values, who experience life through the same lens that we experience it through. And I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I find that inspiring. So let's get to work. I've only got an hour, hour and a half with you guys. Of course, I told Jonas I was gonna finish around four o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Um, the time will fly. So I want to begin by asking an important question, and it is this. Who is in charge of your life? Who is in charge of your life? You know, it's, it's an important question. And you know, I'm curious even what's, what's your immediate thought to that? Maybe a little, like your mind goes a little blank, like, gosh, I'm not sure who's in charge of my life. Maybe it's, oh, God, my kids are. How many of you are in that camp? Yeah, good. Um, you know, maybe it's, oh, my caseload, my boss, my career. Who's in charge of your life? And I, I think that's a really important fundamental question because without being able to grapple with and answer that question, we're left to lead our lives and operate our careers somewhat by default. Like it's just kind of going to go however it's going to go. And I really believe that we are living in a time in American culture and perhaps in even human evolution that we don't have the luxury of letting life turn out however it's going to turn out. Are you with me on that? Yes. We don't have the luxury to be casual about our career, about our profession, about our values. This is a time in American history and in human history that we need to be really clear in our social work value of empowerment. And we are so good, aren't we, at empowering other people? You know where I'm going with this. <clears throat> we are so good at being there for and doing for and attending to. And what we're going to grapple with in this hour and a half today is the degree to which we are empowering ourselves. So let's dig into that. I've heard a social, me social media meme recently that says, empowered women empower women, and empowered men as well. But empowered women empower women. And it's supposed to be this like, yeah, you know, we stand together kind of thought. And I love that. I am definitely all about empowering women, empowering men, men empowering women, women empowering men. But how about this? As empowered women, we empower ourselves. Really? Because if you are not leading an empowered life, let me ask you, to what degree can you really empower others? In fact, I believe the true, the true path of empowerment starts from a deep sense of grounding in empowering yourself in the way that you are leading your own life and your own career. And we have to lead empowered lives. Social workers are visionaries, aren't we? We have a vision for humanity. We have a vision for society. We have a vision for our clients. It's an important time for us to have a vision because without having a vision, we lose hope. And without hope, we give up our endless drive to make the world a better place. And we need that vision, we need that hope, we need that self-empowerment at a deep level. Because let's face it, it's not so pretty out there right now, is it? We're dealing with all kinds of issues around gun violence and police brutality with guns, the foster care system, the dearth of qualified, caring foster homes for children. I, uh, la last year and the year before, for many years, I've done a lot of work in DCF. And sometimes I would, 
uh, go in to do a training in one of the offices, and I see like little cots on the office floors, or little mats, yoga mats kind of thing, on the office floors with blankets on them, because kids sometimes have to get picked up after school, come into their social worker's office, take a nap, maybe lay down, and then they get taken to a different foster home every night, an emergency placement. There is a dearth of foster care placements available. And then the endlessly long lines and the waiting for access to good quality mental health care, access to emergency room care, access to rehab programs. And that's for hearing people. I, I specialize in the deaf community. The access for deaf people is even less so. And then, of course, the opioid crisis. I just chose these four topics, but we could just spend right the next hour saying this topic and this topic and this topic and this topic. So we have got to center ourselves in this strong place of self-empowerment. But I'm excited, and I hope you are as well, because there's a new wave coming, isn't there? There's a new wave coming. There's a new wave coming in our world right now. That what, these, what this youth movement has done in this last month and six weeks, they organized an international movement in less than four weeks' time. It was extraordinary. It's an extraordinary time. And we can be the people who are the ones leading that. We can be the ones that say, yeah, you know, let's be on this new wave and let's Go ahead and call it a blue wave, if we will, right? But how are we going to do that? How do we, this is the question I really want us to grapple with, how do we maintain that sense of vision and hopefulness and clarity and self-empowerment when we feel so overwhelmed with what there is to do in the day-to-day -day living of our lives? It's intense, isn't it? So how do we do that? How do we maintain that sense of empowerment without losing our sanity and sacrificing our very soul? It's an important question. People say to me, you know, Jackie, if I just had a few more hours in the day, if I just had a few more hours, I could get things done. How many of you have all said that, right? Let me tell you what you would do if you had a few more hours in the day, right? What would you do? Yeah, you'd run around being as crazy, frenetic, overwhelmed, I got so much to do in those extra three hours, wouldn't you? Yeah, you know you would, right? So time isn't the issue. Here's the truth. You can't manage time. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? You can't manage time. Now, why do I say that? Well, let me prove it to you. We're all together here in this space. And we can spend this next 60 minutes being really engaged in kind of new thoughts and stimulating ideas. We can reflect on our lives and think about our clients. Or we could do nothing at all. I'm going to get my darn check from NASW. <laughs> my PowerPoint's been done. We could stand here and do nothing. You could check your phone. Maybe you're getting a little annoyed, like, come on, get on with things. The time is passing, isn't it? The same 60 minutes is going to occur, the same 90 minutes is going to occur, regardless of what we all do. So the question then isn't, how do I manage this external? Notice, we're trying to manage all these things outside of us. How do I manage the external of time? The question is, how do you manage yourself? Now, I don't know if that's the good news or the bad news. You're going to have to sort that out for yourself, right? In fact, time management, you may not know this, time management was created in the 1970s, right? In the 1970s, kind of in the post-industrial era, when things were a little bit simpler and people went to work and then they came home and, and then women started entering the workforce in droves and then the men said, oh, wait a minute, we've got to figure out how to manage time if the women are in the workforce, right? So some of you maybe were being born in the 70s. So I wanted to reference what life was like back then. This is how we engaged in entertainment in the 1970s. Yeah, this is it. This is how we engaged in entertainment with the three or four local channels that we had. Yeah. This is how you wrote your uh, case notes and your papers for school. This is how we did all of our work. How many of you remember using one of these? All right. Oh, I love you. I love you guys. That's awesome. I'm really feeling right to home. And this is what was happening in politics. Okay, maybe things haven't changed quite so much. 
right? But you get my point, right? It's like this is what life was looked like when we started this notion of managing time. So I'm going to say that's an antiquated notion. It no longer fits to the complexity and the pace of the world that we live in. So then the question becomes, what do we do? What do we do? If we don't manage time, what do we do? So I'm going to propose that we learn to manage our energy instead of time, tasks, and to-dos. Manage your personal energy. Now, often when people talk about that notion of managing their energy, what they think about is managing their vitality, managing my body, like how well I eat and how much sleep I get. Ariana Huffington now is on this whole thing about sleep. I think she wrote a book on sleep, right? It's kind of like the new thing. And I'm all for that. You do have to take care of your body. You know, get to the gym, exercise. But that's really only one component of the complexity of being a human being, isn't it? That's just one area of being a human being. Liken it to this. Imagine you had a really sexy car, <clears throat> right? You have this like really hot car, and you took great care of your car. You get it washed and waxed every week. And you, you know, get it serviced all the time, and it's really running awesome. But you never do anything with cleaning out the inside. <laughs> Right? You'd have a really sweet looking car, but it wouldn't be a very pleasant experience of it. That to me is the difference between managing time, getting all of your external ducks in a row, but not managing your energy, which is about your inner world. So what I'm going to propose today is that we learn and train ourselves and our clients to manage both the content of our life, the times, tasks, and to-dos, all that there is to do in life, the outer elements, and the context of your life, meaning the inner elements of your life. I came upon this, this notion of managing energy rather than time in a very interesting way. I'm from here in Massachusetts, although the, uh, Sherry said I just moved to DC. I still say I'm from Massachusetts. <laughs> That's okay with y'all. Um, so I've been here for the last 30 years. So I'm from Massachusetts, and I was working at Westboro State Hospital. I was the clinical unit director of the deaf unit, and I also play racquetball and basketball. I was also uh, teaching a class and taking classes. So I was working full time. Oh, and I had a private practice. So working full time, had a private practice, teaching a class, taking a class, playing in two racquetball leagues and playing basketball. My landlord once said to me, Jackie, I think you pay rent so your cat has some place to sleep. <laughs> right? So you get a sense of that, right? How I came upon this notion of managing energy. And imagine, while I was living that life, I started having some physical conditions. I started, um, I actually started in my arm, bursitis and tendonitis and tendonitis here from racquetball, but it wasn't getting better. In fact, it was getting worse. After six months, eight months, it was getting worse to the point where I couldn't pick up a book, I couldn't hold my racquetball racket. I was really quite impaired. And I tried a bunch of different, you know, cortisone and blah, 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 all these things. And a friend of mine said, hey, Jackie, I, I work with this great acupuncturist over in Natick. Why don't you give it a try? I was like, sure. So I went into his office, and, and this, you know, little Asian man, he was very quaint and warm and pleasant, and he, he did this assessment on me. And, he finished up and he said, well, take a minute, but when you're done, you know, come into my office across the hall. So I went into his office and I look across this room and there's this big walnut desk that seemed a little too big for this little man sitting behind it. And I sat down in front of him and he said, you're very driven, aren't you? <laughs> I said, excuse me? And he said, well, I, I can help you with this, with the arm. He said, but I have to tell you, that's not the problem. And I said, oh, and he said, well, you're, you're very driven and type A and competitive, and I wanted to smack him. <laughs> <clears throat> and then he said something really that changed my life. He said, the problem isn't your arm. The problem is that for someone as young as you are, your life force energy, your chi, is incredibly low. And if you don't change how you're living and start managing your energy, you're probably not going to live very long. Nice bedside manner, right? <laughs> I just met the dude. And I went home that night, and I just cried, really. Because I was like in the middle of it, right? My career was going well, and I thought I was doing everything right. I'm like still taking care of my body, and my career's going well, and you know, I was, I was kind of rising in my social work profession, and I was really excited about what was happening in my life, and yet, and yet, so what I had to grapple with is that 
if I didn't learn some way of bringing the fullness of who I am, the fullness of who you are, into life in a way that both brings forth and sustains, that I would never really experience what I wanted to. Map that onto yourself. If you're not bringing forth what you want to bring forth in a way that contributes but also sustains. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I've broke it down into three concepts that I want to get into. And they are this, power, purpose, and productivity. Power, what I mean by power, what I'm going to talk about with that is self-empowerment. Because let me ask you, how often do you feel overwhelmed with everything that's being asked of you? How often do you feel like you can't keep up with the day-to-day -day expectations? And not even all that's being asked of you, but then all that you want to do as well. You know, it's a blessing and a curse, right? To be a high consciousness, high vibration, high intelligence, high energy person. It's a blessing and a curse, because it's like, wow, it's a big world out there. But it's like, wow, it's a big world out there. <laughs> and you got to deal with that. So how often do you feel that way? Maybe the problem is not only everything that's being asked of you, but also how you are responding to all that's being asked of you. Forgetting that you have the power to choose what's being asked of you. I was at the gym last week playing racquetball with a friend of mine, and uh, it was Friday afternoon. I said, hey, what you got going on this weekend? And she's like, oh, she looked, she's like, oh, I'm so busy. You know that, right? Oh, I'm so busy. And I was like, oh, I, you know, I'm a social worker. I, my immediate empathy radar went off. Like, oh, really? Like, what's going on? I thought there was like something in her life. I was like, what's going on? She's like, well, you know, tonight, you know, I've got this get together with my college friends. And then tomorrow, both of my kids have soccer games. So I got to go in the morning to one soccer game, and then in the afternoon to another soccer game. And then in the evening, my husband and I are having a get together and we've got some friends coming over. Then Sunday, I go to church and I sing in the choir and I have to be there a half hour early. And then I go to a book study group after that. And then I get home and it's starting the weekend all over again. I was like, sounds like a nice weekend. <laughs> Right? Now I did have to, I have to admit, I had a moment's pause of wanting to engage in the arms race of busyness with her. <laughs> you all know that game, right? The arms race of busyness? How many of you have played that? It's like, well that's really, that's all you're doing? Oh, well I've got that and I'll be up until midnight doing my emails because I've got so many. Yeah, right? No, busy is the new rich, right? <laughs> that is the laughter of recognition. You know, I can just see it with a big guilty sign right here. Busy is the new rich. In fact, there is social science research that has, has proven in the last year that the more busy you are perceived to be, the higher status someone ascribes to you. Yes. How screwed up is that? <laughs> but it's a good litmus test. Now I know when people think highly of me because they'll say, Jackie, I know you're really busy, but I'm like, oh, they like me. <laughs> yeah. It's a way that you know. And we use this whole notion of I'm busy and I'm so busy. But what's it costing us? So let's look at this quote from Susan uh, Coven from MGH. In the past few years, I've observed an epidemic of sorts, patient after patient, suffering from the same condition. The symptoms of this condition include fatigue, irritability, insomnia, anxiety, headaches, heartburn, back pain, and weight gain. There are no blood tests or x-rays diagnostic of this condition, and yet it is easy to recognize. What do you think it is? Life, Life. yeah. <laughs> Oops. The condition is excessive busyness. The condition is excessive busyness, causing all of those things, having so much going on. How many of you can relate, right? So there's, we're living in this really weird time psychologically where there's this pull of like, I kind of got to be busy because what else am I going to be like? Yeah, I got nothing going on, <laughs> right? So we're in this odd pull where there's this social status of being busy while simultaneously we really feel what it's costing us. And then look at this quote, beware the barrenness of a busy life. That's interesting, isn't it? Beware the barrenness of a busy life. Who do you think said that? Any ideas? <laughs> Thoreau? Yeah, no, that's good that you guys are on that. That's actually a quote from Socrates. 
it was like, like what, what was it, like 100, you know, like year 200, like, I don't know, it was like, it was like ancient times. So this whole notion of this pull of the external world leaving us with a sense of emptiness internally is not just a condition of our times, although I think it's exacerbated in the times we're living in. It's part of the human condition. That's part of uh, what we're dealing with uh, psychologically in, these, in this busy is the new rich time that we're dealing with. Let's look neurologically what we're dealing with. More data was created in 2017 than all of the previous 5,000 years. Ouch, right? More data was created in, the last, in 2017, so in the last year, than in all of the previous 5,000 years. And so how does that impact us? So there's this constant sense of like what's happening and what's happening. We're, we're constantly plugged in. We're constantly on adrenaline. And what that results in are all of these conditions, things that have been called information overload, data fog. You know, data fog, where you just feel like you can't really focus, you can't really pay attention. Cognitive overload, time famine, information fatigue syndrome, which actually has a whole list of clinical criteria that goes with it. Uh, things like compulsively checking your device, put that thing away. <laughs> compulsively checking your device, uh, feeling like you're in a, in a hurry even when you are not. It's called hurry sickness, <laughs> right? How many of you feel that way? You're like driving down the Mass Pike at like 95 miles an hour, like I don't even have any place I have to go. <laughs> it's like, what is that? Relax. You know, I mean, we're in New England, by the way. We're like so uptight. We're undereducated with our master's degrees in, in New England, right? And here's my personal favorite, data asphyxiation. And we're just like drowning in all this data and all this information. And here's the truth. There's nothing wrong with you in the sense of overwhelm that, that you're living in. It's just that your neurology has not kept up with technology. Your neurology has not kept up with technology. We are digital immigrants living in a de digital native time. Do you understand that? We are digital immigrants, most of us, some of you, you know, on the younger side, but most of us in this room are digital immigrants. My son is, oh, he'll be 13 next month, and he's been raised without uh, media and technology until on his 11th birthday, my mother-in-law decided it would be a good idea to give him a phone without asking me. But anyway, <laughs> this is being recorded. I can't say anything more than that. So my son, <laughs> I love my mother-in-law. Um, I really do, except for the fact that she gave my, all right, no, no, I'm not going down that tunnel. <laughs> so my son was raised without technology, without computer games, without television, without, without media, until he was 11. So he's, only, he'll, he's 12 and three quarters. He'll be, he'll be 13 next month. He can pick up a phone, pick up a computer game, pick up uh, an app, uh, anything with technology, and figure it out like that. Like that. Now, he's not been raised with it. I'm telling you, there is a change. Do you know that um, uh, cultural anthropologist Jean Houston, someone who I enjoy following, she says that there, there are times in human evolution that are called jump times. That thousands and thousands of years, humanity kind of goes along and it goes along relatively in the same fashion. And then there are things that happen like boom, and there's a tremendous shift in what's happening in our culture, right? And she says, and I agree, we are in an evolutionary jump time where the life as we knew it in the past, in the pre-information era, is wildly different than what we are living in now. Can you see that? And I like to just say, it's hell in the hallway. Like, that last door is closed. We're not going back to the pre-technology era, but the new door isn't open yet. We're not quite neurologically adapted to what it's like living in this information age. So it's hell in the hallway. So I'm saying all of this because I know that some of you walk around, probably many of you walk around with just some sense of like, what's wrong with me? I should be able to keep up. What's wrong with me? Look at them. They're keeping up. Do you know what they're saying? What's wrong with me? I should be keeping up. What's wrong with me? <laughs> I know I live in your head. <laughs> I teach this stuff and that's what I got in my head. Right, that's what we've got to grapple with. So at each section, I'm gonna give you a few tips on how to do it better. So here's what I wanna say about this whole piece in self 
empowerment, how to enhance your sense of self-empowerment, because really without it, your life is going to get lived for you. Your career is going to get decided for you without that sense of clarity and self-empowerment. So the first thing I want to say to you, and it sounds so trite and so simple, but I cannot say more strongly how important it is. Set small goals every day about things that are important to you. There's a wonderful book by a Harvard researcher and professor named uh, Tal Ben-Shahar. Do you guys know Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar? He's, he's a teacher at Harvard. He teaches the most popular class at Harvard University. Do you know what it's on? Happiness. Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar, he teaches a course at Harvard University on happiness, and then he wrote a book about, about five years ago called Happier. And one of the things in that book that I loved learning, pay attention to this, it's so great, where pe what, he, what he found in his research is that people are happier in the active pursuit of meaningful goals than they are after they achieve them. Isn't that fascinating? Again, map this onto your own life. When you're striving towards something that's important and meaningful to you, you're engaged. You're like doing it. And then you accomplish it. And yes, you have a brief period of like, yeah, that was awesome. And then very quickly, your sense of happiness, fulfillment, and contentment goes down. So one of the most important things that you can do for yourself that will also help you focus and not be so busy, busy all the time, but focus on, OK, what are the one or two things I want to be sure I put into my day? What do I want to be sure I accomplish today? And the best way to do that is learn to say no more often. How many of you have some issue with that? Good. I want you to do some of me right now, OK? <clears throat> How many of you are like, oh, I just can't say no? How many of you are in that camp? I'm willing to tell the truth about it? All right, good. Let's do this together. No. No. Oh, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? Let's try it again. No. No. No, thank you. No, thank you. It's not so bad. You practice that 20 times a day, it's going to get easier. Because here's the thing, you know, I mean, I get it, guys. You know, I love life. You know, I am a yes to life kind of person. But the truth is, if you are a yes to everything, you will be a no to your peace of mind. <clears throat> yeah, I can take that client. Yeah, I can do that project. Yeah, I can, I, I can work on that committee. Yeah, I can do that. But when we don't recognize that saying a yes, everything that we say, a yes, say yes to requires what? requires your time, requires your energy, requires your focus, requires your heart. So you've got to be much more mindful of letting your yes be yes, but also letting your no be no. No, thank you. Yeah, I'd really love to do that. Unfortunately, I can't. And I'll get into this more in the workshop later, but I don't want you to say, I don't have time for that, right? It's not where we want to go. I don't have time for that. Don't be going down that tunnel. I have all the time in the world. And I'm not going to choose, this is my favorite line, I'm not going to choose to spend my time that way. Right? It's a self-empowered way. Say no more often. If you are a yes to everything, you will be a no to your peace of mind. <clears throat> and then thirdly, cultivate your ability to choose what is coming at you. Your ability to choose how you respond to what's coming at you, rather than just you know, feeling like you're being inundated. There's all kinds of things that are coming at you in life, aren't there? There's, you know, maybe you can't choose how long your commute is, right? So how many of you have a long commute? Sit on the Mass Pike or 93, or yeah, you got a long commute. So and maybe if some of you spend a lot of time in your car uh, doing, you know, seeing clients. So maybe you can't change your commute or how much time you spend in your car, but you can decide how you're going to use that time. You can use that time more positively. Maybe you can't change how much paperwork you're doing, but you can decide, you can learn to be more effective in how you do it. Uh, there's all kinds of things that we can't change, but you can always change how you relate to each one of them. But let me ask you this. Are you choosing to mold your inner world? We spend so much time focused on the outer world activities, when in fact, the most important task that must be done every day of our lives is just that five minutes to turn inward, that one deep breath between the two things, important things that you have to do. 
Learning to mold your inner world of thought and attitudes and beliefs is the, it, that, it, that too is a task that must be done. In fact, I would argue it's the most important task that much be, must be done. But how much time do you spend focusing, feeling, reflecting on how you're going to respond to all that's being asked of you? Which leads me to my next of the three points I want to work with you on today, and that's purpose. Purpose. You know, the content of the work that we do is often very difficult. We sit with people who are in an enormous amount of pain. We listen to very, very difficult stories. We experience vicarious trauma on a regular basis. So the content of the work that we do is often very difficult. But, but isn't that true of almost anything, right? I mean, the content of being a parent is not exactly all that much fun. You know, how many of you are parents? Yeah, you know, how, how many times do you have to say, like, you know, please pick up the dirty socks, get the socks off the, off the couch. No, you can't leave your cleats at the bottom of the stairs. No, please put that away before you go to bed tonight. Uh, yes, you have to go to practice. No, you can't have your phone before you uh, get your homework done, right? Like, it's constant. So if we really just look at the day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day content of being a parent, it's like, eh. <laughs> Who really wants to do that? <clears throat> But that's not what we do. We, re we recognize that we have this opportunity to create family legacy, to engage over generations, to mold this person, this soul, this being. It's the same with our social work lives. You know, hour to hour, maybe it is really hard. The paperwork is, I mean, don't even. <laughs> yeah, you all know what the, you know, I mean, it's so, it can be so draining. But if you just focus on the day-to-day -day content versus the bigger reason, your compelling why of why you were doing this. So the best thing that you can do to focus on your purpose in calming your chaos in your life is to shift from content to context. And what I mean by that is, you know, and it's, it's not easy to do when you feel like you got so much coming at you. But what I mean by context is focusing on the attitudinal and energetic environment that you are. Or the attitudinal and energetic environment of your team. Focusing on creating your context. You know, none of you, when you, were, when you were a child and somebody said, hey, what do you want to be when you're growing up? None of you are like, oh, I want to be totally stressed out, burned out, and max, you know, max, to the, you know, max to the core. I, I, no, none of you said that. You had this vision for how, you, know, like, you want to make a difference, you want to contribute. But then you get in the day-to-day -day of it, and it's easy to feel so incredibly bogged down. So in order to get beyond that, in order to get beyond the day-to-day -day difficulty and the energy drains that we face doing this work sometimes, the way to do that is to ask some of those bigger questions, like, what am I doing this for anyway? What am I doing this for anyway? And then be able to answer that, to have a clear, definitive answer that calls you higher into the fullness of who you really are. And in fact, even answering a bigger question what's the purpose of all this? What's my purpose? Why am I here? Have you ever asked that question, what's my purpose? Yeah, you're just not willing to tell the truth. Thank you. A few of you are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the rest of you are like, no, I never asked that, Jackie. <laughs> of course you did. It's a fundamental human question, right? You can all relate to that. Your clients grapple with that question. And it's important to be able to answer it. And because it's a question that I love, and it's a question that I grapple in a lot, I'm gonna just do you a favor and I'm gonna answer it for you today. <laughs> Isn't that great? I'm just gonna answer it for you. I'm gonna tell you why you're here. You're here to grow in consciousness, to grow and evolve in a particular way. To, you remember I said at the beginning, what, we're here, what will help you calm the chaos is managing your energy rather than your time. When we get into this a little bit, what I mean is managing your energetic consciousness. So I've created this model of energetic consciousness that's based on the work of Dr. David Hawkins, Bruce Schneider, Ken Wilber, and a few other uh, philosophers and researchers, psychologists and social workers. And 
And I've broken it down into these just kind of four ways that people engage in life. So let's look at it. So what I'm say, when I say you're here to grow in consciousness, I'm talking about you moving from this kind of low level of the way you experience life or your clients experience life. I'm sure none of you ever experience it this way. <laughs> Glad you got the joke. You're still with me. That was good. And it's what I call survival consciousness. And in survival consciousness, it's just like, yeah, you know, why bother? It's just too hard. I'm not even going to. I can't. It's too much. It's too much that it's too much and I'm not going to. So there's a sense of apathy and resignation. Why bother? It's all too much. Help rejecting complainers. Have you, any of you ever have any of those on your caseload? <laughs> yeah, right? Well, have you, could you maybe, have you thought of, oh yeah, no, oh yeah, no, oh yeah, no. Yeah, but, right? That, it's not, it's not like because they're bad or they're lazy. They just can't see the world any other way. It's the lens through which they are perceiving life. And I call that survival consciousness. As you grow and kind of move up in, in, in your consciousness and your ability, I say you move into what's called stress consciousness. And it is a more active, more engaged part of life, but it's like, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. It's because there's so much to do and there's so much work. And that's just your lens. Like if you, see, you know, like that friend that I was talking to at the gym who had like all these really cool things that she was doing. And I was like, hey, what if you just like did less? I'm like, oh yeah, no, I can't, right? <laughs> Right, it's just the way people are. So there you move from like apathy into a more active realm, but it's still fairly unpleasant, right? It's still fairly unpleasant and it's unpleasant to be around. Consciousness research says that mainstream America lives between these two levels, right? Consciousness research has taught us that. As you continue to grow, grow in consciousness, get education, go to therapy, go to an AA meeting, come to a meeting like this, do, get some education and inspiration in your life, you can continue to change your filter, change your perception, change your consciousness into what I call transformation consciousness. And what that means is that you're starting at that level to recognize like life just is and I am. And how I bring myself to life has a lot to say about how life responds to me, right? Changing your energy, bringing that high, more, more high vibe living, high vibe feel to yourself. You can feel it, right? You can feel it immediately when you are around people that are living in that very low sense of consciousness versus people who are upbeat, optimistic, that high vibe life. Now the question is for you and for your clients, how do you keep moving yourself into these higher and higher realms? You won't do that when you're walking around stressed out, burned out, and overwhelmed all the time. You just won't. So the last level that I talk about is what I call transcendence consciousness. <clears throat> and here we're really talking about people that have completely, have really mastered life like the, a sense of just unconditional love and connection and unity and oneness. Uh, a sense of, of peace and transcendence. I see a lot of you are taking notes, and thank you, I'm glad, grateful, but it also makes me think, uh, you can download this PowerPoint on the NASW website, so you can get a copy of that. Why'd y'all laugh at that? So here's something I didn't tell you earlier. So I love this program that I'm teaching you and that I'll be teaching in the workshop, partly because um, I actually was diagnosed soon after the acupuncturist told me I was gonna die. Um, <laughs> I was then, I met with Bruce Hallowell over in Sudbury. So what, what does Bruce Hallowell do? ADD. ADHD. And guess what Bruce Hallowell told me? That I have ADD, right? So I am your special needs keynote speaker, just in case you're <laughs> wondering about that. So all, I see these hands moving over there. I'm like, what are they doing? Are they writing notes? Are they taking notes? Right? So I've learned as I'm in front of the room, I just address it. I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing? And it just goes better. I can focus again, right? No, so, uh, so anyway, I think that I, you can download this PowerPoint someplace so you can get this. So, um, so you can see this, right? And you can map this onto your own life. And then here's the coolest thing about it that I, I really want to point to you. Notice this arrow that's entering in on the screen. What that arrow means is it's not like you statically live in this transcendent consciousness all the time, no matter what's coming your way, even when you're stuck in traffic at the Mass Pike and everything is just beautiful. It's not like that. We, we kind of move in and out of these various levels of consciousness. But as we grow, and this is going back to purpose, this is what I believe your purpose, my purpose, and the purpose of humanity is. To move from these lower levels of consciousness into unity consciousness, into transcendent consciousness. Creating a world where that sense of unity and oneness and holism 
is the way that we live. Right? That's, what I, that's what I believe. And so, you know, we're in the dance. Our clients are in the dance. We're moving up and down. I believe really strongly <clears throat> that as you're able to live in more and more in the higher levels of consciousness, you, you train yourself, your emotions, your thoughts, your attitudes, your beliefs, so that you become this high vibration person, that it impacts the life around you. When I wrote this book, Calming the Chaos, I was invited a few months afterwards to an author's conference by my publisher. <clears throat> and the date was coming close, and the conference was in Las Vegas. And my spouse said to me over dinner one night, hey, we got to get your tickets. You haven't bought your airfare. You haven't taken care of the airfare yet to go to the conference. And in my highest transcendent self, I was like, yeah, no, I'm not going. <laughs> and she's like, what do you mean you're not going? I was like, you know, I'm such a wallflower. I'm a complete introvert. I'd be like walking around, like, and the, the purpose of the conference is to meet book bloggers and podcasters and book reviewers. And I'm like, I can just be like, hi, I'm Jackie, and this is my book. Would you like to talk to me? I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be that girl, right? So I'm like all in it, right? I'm all in my ego. I'm completely resigned. I can't do it. Why bother? There's no point. It's not going to work out. You can see where my consciousness was. Isn't it great? I teach this. <laughs> well, the downside of teaching this is that my poor spouse has to listen to it all the time. So she looks across the table and says, well, that's just lovely, Jackie. Where's your consciousness now? <laughs> to which I said, shut up. So off I go to the conference. <clears throat> and I go to one of these big plenary sessions like this. There was tables around. And I always go early because I'm like really socially awkward and introverted. And so I go in early so I can like find my place. So I go in early and I find my place next to this other guy that looks very socially awkward and introverted. <laughs> and we strike up a conversation. And we're in Las Vegas, but it turns out he's from uh, New Hampshire and I'm from Massachusetts. And he has an adopted child and I have an adopted child. He has a transracial family. I have a transracial family. He's getting into meditation. I've been a long time meditator. So we have like these connections, right? And we're like getting along and it's like, I'm having a great time. And then he says to me, so are you an author? And I was like, <laughs> Yes, 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 this is my book. And he's like, wow, this is great energy. Yeah, this is so where it's at. People need to know about this. I was like, oh, wow, you know, I really felt good. I was like, thank you. I was like, so are you an author? And he says, no, I'm, I'm a book blogger from Inc. Magazine. I was like, oh, great. So um, in all of my social awkwardness, would you like to review my book? And he says, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, great. Um, well, here, you, you can have it. And we continued on. And then I left the conference, and then like a, a week or so went by, and I emailed him. Hey, Jeffrey, how's it going? You know, how's your kids? I hope all's well. You're not too far away. I'd love to keep in touch. Nothing. <laughs> Two weeks go by. I get on my email. Hey, Jeffrey, how's it going? How's that meditation? Did you get a chance to look at my book? Nothing. So he had told me at the time, if I review your book, don't worry about it, your Twitter will blow up. I thought, he's really full of himself, this guy. <clears throat> Nine months later, I'm going about my day. I look at my phone at some point, Twitter, Jackie Woodside, coming to chaos. Jackie Woodside, Jackie Woodside. My first thought, my account's been hacked. <laughs> yeah, my account's been hacked. So I look through it, and sure enough, I go through this article in Inc. Magazine, and I see Brene Brown and I see Elizabeth Gilbert, Big Magic, and there on the top 10 list of 2015 motivational books, Jackie Woodside, Calming the Chaos. So yeah, it was a wonderful moment. So let me, and it was really great. So, so I send him this email, Jeffrey, thank you so much. I really appreciate you know, the nod. It was really so nice of you. And I get this response, you're welcome. <laughs> We're tight, Jeffrey and I. We're like this. We're like this, right? So let me ask you, what was the pivotal moment of that story? What was the pivotal moment of that story? Going, right? Going, but something happened before I went. What was it? Where's your consciousness? It was the moment that I went from <clears throat> that place of apathy and resignation of like, I'm not that and I can't do it and blah, 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 to yes, I'm an author, here's my book. Regrounding myself in my commitment, regrounding myself in my sense of values and my purpose. So let me ask you, 
what's going on in your life right now, <coughs> that you spend a little too much time in that place of apathy, of resignation, like, oh, screw it, it's just too much, or I'm, that drivenness, <clears throat> I gotta push, I gotta do more. My book sales went up like 150% in the month following that article. I didn't do anything but change my energy and show up, right? That's what's ours to do. And in fact, getting back to my acupuncturist story, people who have a strong sense of purpose live eight years longer than those who do not. So screw you, Mr. Acupuncturist man. <laughs> Can I say that? Can I say that? So then, so you guys with me? Like this, this importance of, of, of growing and having a clear sense of purpose, but then I don't know, I know we're social workers and we kind of do this, right, for a living, but how do we do that? How do we maintain that sense, that high sense, that high vibe in the day-to-day -day living of our lives? So I wanna just talk about that a little bit and one of the ways that I'm very passionate about is just being super clear on what you value and then molding your life to be a display of that. It's not enough to know your values, you have to demonstrate your values in your day-to-day -day life. So if someone asked me, you know, when that book came out, do you value this message? I would have said, yeah, of course. Do you value getting it out to people? Do you think it'll help? Like, Absolutely. But then, so I had, I had that set of values, but then I had the behavior of like, yeah, no, why bother? Right, so there was a complete disconnect. So one of the most important things that you can do, and in fact, in Japan, there's a word for it, it's called ikigai. Ikigai, and it's exp expressing through your life that which is most meaningful to you, like dedicating your life to that which is most meaningful to you. So if you're not super clear, and I don't mean like all of the 20 or 30 or 100 things that you can value in life, I mean really s s distilling it down to three or four or five of your top values and then molding everything about how you talk, what you do, how you spend your time, in alignment with those values. So I was talking to a friend of mine about this and she said, well, it's not that easy to know how to do that. And because I've been a professional coach for a long time, I have tons of values inventories. So if you're interested in it, <clears throat> to go a little further with this, I actually just put up this inventory on my website on a page just for you guys. So it's JackieWoodside.com slash NASW. And you can go download a values clarification inventory. There's actually two different ones. So you do inventory A and then inventory B and then you distill those down into what are my top five core values. And if you don't wanna to go to my website, you're like, yeah, I've seen enough of you, thank you very much. Just Google values clarification inventories. There's tons of them. Now here's what I wanna to say to you about um, as a clinician. You know, it's really striking to me that we don't ask on our intake forms with clients, what are your, what are you value in life? What are your values? If we focused more there and then helping our clients really think about and distill that, you know, I remember when I, I was working with um, clients who have long-term persistent mental illness and their values really were like, you know, I wanna have a job and I wanna be happy and I wanna have a sense of freedom. And it was really easy to help them, well, okay, great, if you want those things, then what do we have to do? And it was things like get out of bed before noon or get out at a reasonable time and take a shower and uh, you know, be able to go and talk and maintain eye contact and a conversation in the workplace, and we would really break it down. So this really is applicable no matter what level of life you're talking about. I use this with you know, corporate CEOs and helping them distill how they want their values to be in their company, and you can use it with people who are young children or who have significant mental, mental health challenges. It doesn't matter. It's a human experience. Okay, so JackieWoodside.com slash NASW if you want to look at that, or just Google values clarifications inventories. You'll find a million of them in .00002 seconds. All right, next thing per game. What's the topic right now? Purpose, thank you. Just be sure you're with me. Next thing, how to be sure that you are living that high vibe, high consciousness life. What's that say? Avoid the negaholics. You know, the negaholics, right? <clears throat> you know who they are. The people in life that no matter what's happening for them, it's not good enough and they're not happy about it. So, uh, and they, if you, how many of you are in workplaces versus self-employed? How many of you are in workplaces? Yeah, you know what the negaholics do, don't they? They form negapods. <laughs> 
Yeah, they form negapods. And the, in the negapod, they like have the, their little clatches, their negaclatch. And then they try to bring in other people into their little negapod, right? So, you know, if you really you're committed, given that you have a commitment to being in this high consciousness, high vibe way, that you understand, like, oh yeah, I can really get, that is kind of our purpose to just continue to evolve as, as a human species, then what you need to do is really just not engage in that way. Now, some people that sometimes say, well, what if it's my office mate, or what if it, you know, I understand that you may have these people, but I'm telling you, <laughs> I, I have some great strategies and uh, you know when people come complaining about you about other people to you in the workplace my favorite thing to say is like oh wow I really get it that's really upsetting let's go tell her about it <laughs> yeah. they're like no 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 I don't want to do that <clears throat> oh really really well that's all right I'll go tell her for you I'll tell her you told me it's like oh no 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 and then you just be like oh wow really well gosh why are you telling me then you do that two or three times, and negaholics are going to leave you alone. <laughs> they're going to talk about you behind your back, mind you. Yeah, but they're just not going to be around you all that much, right? All right, good. So, all right, let's get on to this next piece. I, have, I, like, I want to stop at all of these and talk to you and be like, what do you think of that? But they're like, they told me, like, do my 60 minutes, and then we get to talk to each other, okay? Um, so, you know, write down your questions and, you know, try to remember all these things that I'm saying. I'd love to just interact with you. All right, so this last piece. Oh, I love this, I love this, I love this. So, you know, everybody think the calming the chaos, they're not quite sure what it's about. I mean, it's a kick butt productivity program as well. So it helps you to manage your content of your life, all of the doing, inside of what I call an intentionally created context. Creating your own meaning, creating your own purpose, creating your own values, creating your own vision. You have that. <clears throat> And then you put together these skills on getting things done and being more effective. It's just killer. That's just a killer way to live. But you've got to be careful because there's this myth out there that says that productivity is about getting more done. Right? How many of you believe that? Pro I mean, it's a lot of what we think. Productivity is about getting more things done. I want to tell you there is more to life than getting things done. Right? That becomes empty. It becomes shallow. So. Instead of just getting things done, I want you to think productivity is about expressing yourself at the highest level, fulfilling your potential, and making a meaningful contribution to that which you care about and value. Like, if you start thinking about productivity that way, I mean, honestly, tell me, when you start hearing, like, oh, I got to go to this productivity talk, how many of you are like, woohoo, can't wait for that one? No, it's a little bit like, seriously, like, really, I got to go to a productivity talk? Because it's, you know, we have this sense of like, it's just about getting more things done. And nobody needs one more thing to do, thank you very much. Right? So it's not about getting more things done. It's about bringing the fullness of who you are towards your maximum potential out there for the world. Now, doesn't that light you up a little bit more? And the only thing I did is I changed the context a little bit. So that's what I want you to think about. And then there's this other myth about productivity, is that productivity is a trait, not a skill. Well, I'm just not one of those people. I'm just not very productive. I'm just not very organized. You're saying that because it gives you a pass for developing the skills that are going to make you more effective, right? It lets you stay the same way. <clears throat> so it's not that productivity is a trait, it's a skill. So let me ask you, I'm going to prove that to you, actually. So what happens when you have like a couple of hours at your office and you like have this wide open afternoon and you're like, I'm going to get stuff done. <laughs> I have like so much to get done. I'm going to really get things done. And then, you know, you go, you know, <clears throat> go to your office and you're like, well, I've got so much to do. What am I going to do? <laughs> I know, I'll just check my Facebook page because I've got to get warmed up. <laughs> right? Laughter of recognition, just saying, right? So you're like, there you are on your Facebook page, and somebody comes in you know, to your office, and they've got to talk to you. And they've got an issue, and you've got to go see it on their computer. So you like, go into their office, and now you're all over there with them. And on your way back, you're like, <clears throat> what was I going to do? I've got so much I've got to do. And you're back to your office, and you're like, oh, man, I've only got a half hour left. Well, that doesn't really leave me very long. I, I think I'll just do email, <laughs> right? So what happens is that you, you, know, you have <clears throat> this sense of wanting to get things done, but then you're in the face of it. You're in the face of it, and here's what happens. I don't feel like it. It's very mature. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's very strong ego development. Yeah, I just don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. So, you know, and then, you know, like, I, and then you say to yourself, well, I know. I know what I'll do tomorrow. <clears throat> tomorrow I'll get it done. Tomorrow I'm going to feel like it. <clears throat> you know, tomorrow when I come into work, that's going to be when I really get things done. And then what happens tomorrow? Whoops. Uh, there. Then tomorrow, look what happens. I still don't feel like it. Right? That's what you've got to grapple with. But it's not because you're a bad person. Here's what's happening neurologically. What's happening neurologically when you have all these things to do, your prefrontal cortex is overloaded. It has too many things to, in, in its mind. It's too many things to organize. And you become overloaded. So the limbic system kicks in, which is your emotional center, and it just says, I don't feel like it. That's the center of overwhelm. That's the center of overwhelm. So what do you do? One of the ways that you can help yourself is recognizing that just getting started is the hardest part. How many of you can relate to that? Just getting through that inertia. So the way that you do that is that you can literally set a timer on your phone, be like, I'm just going to do this for five minutes. Can you do that? Like, I'm just going to do this for five minutes. Because then what will happen is something else kicks in. And it's called the Zygernik effect. It's by a um, Bulgarian researcher, uh, what was her name? I think it was Bolga Zygernik, who did some research that showed that there's a feeling of dissonance if we don't finish what we start. So you, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't. all right, five minutes, all right, I can do five minutes. And you get into it, and then the, <clears throat> that inertia is behind you. You feel that compulsion now. I know you're all OCD like I am. You feel that compulsion to actually get it done, and that pushes you through. So the next time you're sitting at your office and you're like, oh, I don't feel like it, I want you to be like, that's what Jackie was talking about. Right? Bring me with you. So I'm going to show you something that's so incredibly powerful. I just think this is so cool. It's called the One Minute Miracle. And this is based on research. I didn't just make this stuff up. All the rest of it I made up. This stuff is real. <clears throat> yeah. One minute of planning saves 12 minutes of unfocused activity. Right? That's what I was talking about. I've got so much to do, but what am I going to do? Because you're, you're like, you, you need that executive functioning to tell you how to actually organize yourself. So I'm going to give you a, a formula, 18 minutes to double your productivity. And you might want to write this down so you can use it before you download this. And it's this, seven minutes in the morning, planning exactly what it is that you are going to do for your day. Not just a to-do list, and I'm going to get in this more in the workshop, not just a to-do list, I suggest you actually place the items in your schedule in a time slot, but spend seven minutes in the morning just getting present to like, okay, it's Thursday. What am I going to do today? And remember what I said earlier, set at least one or two small goals that are things that you're really going to feel good about and that you're going to feel like I had a productive day. Be sure you put those on your schedule. So seven minutes in the morning to plan your day. And then, because life sometimes gets away with this, a check-in, again, set it on your phone. Set an alarm for every 90 minutes, that's six times a day. Spend one minute refocusing. So set a timer for every 90 minutes, just goes off. Oh, that's my timer. You might be in a two-hour meeting and your timer will go off. It's a little embarrassing, whatever. Then you can tell people, well, I'm doing this new productivity thing and they'll all hate you. <clears throat> right, so check in every 90 minutes. And then the last thing is a five minute debrief at the end of the day. Why? Because there'll be things you don't get to. There'll be things that you don't complete. And instead of walking around like, what's wrong with me? I should get more done. I don't know why I don't get more done. You can actually then put those items that you did not accomplish into your next day or the day after. So a debrief at the end of the day. And you can also in your debrief, Look forward to the next day to see what you have coming. So developing your power, purpose, and productivity means managing your energy rather than your time. When you lift your energy up, focusing on what's important to you, focusing on your purpose, that you are here to grow, it literally changes the energy around you and it changes the energy for other people as well. How many of you have heard of the concept of mirror neurons? Yeah. 
When, you're, when your neurology is functioning at a high level, when you're happier, when you're in what I call a higher vibe, in that more transformed state, that more optimistic, clarity, love, unity, oneness, when that's where you come from in life, it unconsciously impacts other people. It lifts people up. <clears throat> all right, they're telling me, wrap up, wrap up, wrap up. I am wrapping up. <laughs> I have all the time in the world for what I need to do. <laughs> right? So there are about, <clears throat> there are about 700, 750, some, there's about 700 people in the room today, 680, 700 people in the room today. I'm going to assume that each of you touches about 100 people a week. The person at the coffee shop, the clients that you interact with, uh, your colleagues at the office, your family, your email, your Facebook buddies. You touch about 100 people a week. I'm going to suggest that we leave here today with this sense of high vibe, purpose, productivity, and power. Bringing that out so that in the next week, we could literally raise the vibe, raise the consciousness of 70,000 people in Massachusetts, right? Doesn't that get you up for something? I want to <clears throat> end with this. There's a quote by George Bernard Shaw that I want to leave you with, and it says this. This is the true joy in life. The being recognized by yourself and being used for a purpose that you recognize as powerful. The being a force of nature rather than a feverish clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. <clears throat> I'm of the belief that my life belongs to the whole community, and for as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. Life is no brief candle to me. It's a sort of splendid torch that I've got hold of, and I want to make it burn as brightly as I can before I hand it on to future generations. I hope you'll all join me in that commitment. Go light your world. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.